I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. has captivated me since I was a boy. Now I travel through time for a living. In this series, I'll seek out the men and women who made a difference. And so the legend grew. Sparked revolutions. That's when the mutiny occurs. And met adversity head on. I want to shine a light on the moments when history changed forever. Winston Churchill famously once said, history is written by the victors, and he should know. The former British Prime Minister spent years airbrushing his own account of World War II. But it's the bits that history's winners leave out that fascinate me. From a bloody mutiny kept quiet for 70 years, to a secret mission that led to the claiming of a continent. I'm on the hunt for the history-changing moments the authorities don't want you to know about. All you need to know is where to look. Tropical Townsville on Australia's north coast. It's just about the last place you'd expect to find a state secret so dangerous that it was suppressed by an American president. To expose what happened, I need to travel back to the dark days of World War II. This is Townsville's main drag, Flinders Street. This is what it looks like today. And this is what it looked like in the 1940s. That, by the way, is a bomb shelter. War had come to the Pacific. The Japanese were moving remorselessly down Southeast Asia, and Australia was in their sights. Townsville was becoming more and more vulnerable. In the wake of the fall of Singapore and the bombing of Darwin in February 1942, Townsville became the forward staging post for the Allied campaign to reclaim the Pacific from the Japanese. That's a pretty spectacular view from up here. But, Ray, it wouldn't have looked like this in the early 1940s, would it? No, certainly not, Tony. The bay in front of us was swarming with Allied shipping, most of it American, but they, the port simply couldn't handle the amount that was coming in. So what they had to do was bring the material directly to the beach. The trucks could simply drive straight out onto the beach and bring the material into the base. Townsville was a very strategic point. It had the port, uh, it had roads going north and south and to the west, and you had these defence positions here, as well as a very large Allied airfield. So is this arming up for the Battle of the Coral Sea? Yes, that, that's correct. Between 1942 and 1943, Townsville's population trebled as 90,000 US and Australian troops poured into the garrison town. But not all of the American army were happy to be here, were they? No, that's correct, Tony. This was a segregated army. There was African Americans, and then there was the white Americans, who were usually the officers in charge of battalions of up to 600. Initially, these African American men were allowed out in the centre of Townsville. They were able to go to the movie theatres, sit in the front seat of taxis, go out with the white girls, do things that they were never allowed to do in the southern states and Georgia. What was wrong with that? The US officers from the southern states often didn't like this and went, this does not go on at home and we're not going to let this occur in Townsville either. So did this cause clashes? 
Absolutely. They're denied leave. They're denied alcohol. They're to work six days a week on this giant airfield. And on the night of 22nd of May 1942, that's when the mutiny occurs between 600 of these men and their officers. A mutiny? What happened? On the night, the ringleaders decide to get heavy machine guns, 50 calibre machine guns, which are usually used for strafing low-flying aircraft, and machine gun the tents of the white officers. Machine gun the tents? I mean, that really is serious, isn't it? Absolutely. These men set fire to the ammunition dump. They take one of the white officers as a hostage and they radio through to command in Townsville. And the primary demand is that the white officer that they liked, that treated them very well, be returned to them. To prevent the mutiny from triggering an all-out civil rights crusade, the soldiers' demands were met. Soon after, they were packed off to New Guinea and all talk of the mutiny was suppressed. That is, until Ray stumbled across a buried report in the library of former US President Lyndon Johnson. In 1942, Johnson, then a congressman, was sent to Australia on a fact-finding mission at the request of President Roosevelt. Johnson finds something extraordinary. He is here two weeks after the mutiny at Kelso, and he speaks to a US war journalist called Robert Sherrod. His initial report into the war situation in Australia is given to Johnson. Johnson says, I'll take this back to the US, to your Washington editors, so they can see the real situation. But Johnson doesn't do this. He goes and takes it direct to Roosevelt, paraphrases Sherrod's report, and produces his research in Australia. And then kept the whole thing under wraps? Absolutely correct. This is such a good story. You will continue researching it, won't you? Absolutely, Tony. And then write the book, and then do the movie. <laughs> and get Spielberg to uh, direct the movie. Yes, absolutely. It's so good. Thank you very much. You heard it here first. Townsville's hidden World War II history is now out in the open. But I'm not finished with the Pacific just yet. I'm on the hunt for another long-lost secret. To find it, I'm going back almost 200 years. In 1769, this vast ocean was the scene of a covert mission that would determine the fate of empires. And it all began with a once-in-a-generation celestial event. At that time, the planet Venus was due to make a rare transit across the sun. English astronomers wanted to observe it from the South Pacific. And that gave King George III of England an idea. For centuries, the superpowers of Europe had been battling for colonial supremacy, spreading out across the globe towards Asia. A bit like today, access to the Chinese market was highly prized in the 18th century. And the idea that the unknown land to the south could be a strategic base in the region was catching on. Britain now had an excuse to pursue her imperial ambitions in the South Pacific, and the well-heeled scientists of the Royal Society had the financial clout to back it. 39-year-old Lieutenant James Cook was charged with leading the expedition. Already a brilliant cartographer and navigator, Cook was the obvious choice to take the scientists to Tahiti. The Navy board purchased a little second-hand coal transport called the Earl of Pembroke. Before handing her to Cook, they refitted her and renamed her the Endeavour. Cook, the ever-stoic Yorkshireman, never complained about his second-hand coal ship, nor having to share his cabin with a bunch of scientists and their gear. It must have been really crowded on board ship. There were 94 people, including the captain, the crew, the scientists, the artists, the one-armed cook, and last but by no means least, the lucky goat, who was a mascot and considered lucky because she'd already sailed round the globe once, hadn't you? In fact, she became as celebrated as any of the other members of the Endeavour. She was given a pension by the British government. Not only that, but she was voted a member of the Royal Society. Not only the first goat, but also the first female ever to be given that award by such an august body of scientists. 
What a lucky girl you were. Cook sailed the endeavour in the opposite direction to most previous explorers of the Southern Seas, who clung to the west coast of Africa before heading eastward across the Indian Ocean. Instead, Cook took the Magellan route across the Atlantic Ocean, down the east coast of South America, around Cape Horn and out into the vast Pacific to locate the tiny island of Tahiti. It took almost eight months to reach it. This was never going to be a jolly little jaunt across the pond. It was dangerous, cutting-edge science through uncharted waters, as big a deal as a moon landing today. But what no one apart from the Navy board knew was that there was another very secret agenda which wouldn't be revealed until the ship was on the other side of the world. You are to proceed in order to make discovery of the continent or land of great extent. There, with the consent of the natives, he will take possession for his majesty by setting up proper marks and inscriptions as first discoverers and possessors. Tom, what do you think would have been going through Cook's mind when he set off? Uh, well, there was the great belief that there had to be uh, a great south land to balance the continents of the northern hemisphere, otherwise the world would tip, uh, and Cook's objective was to find this great south land. So in a way, part of it's adventure, part of it's this idea that there might be some massive commercial bonus, but there's also science yes. and intellectual inquiry. Yes, uh, and uh, you don't know what bonus you're going to get. Cook began his quest for the great southern land by heading across the Pacific. First, he charted and claimed New Zealand for the crown. Then, on the evening of the 19th of April, 1770, Cook knew he was getting close. Seabirds started to appear. It's as though Cook could smell land ahoy. And indeed, at 6 a.m. the next morning, they found it. They bumped into nothing less than an island continent. Cook had taken 20 months to guide his overloaded little ship to the end of the world, but they could now lay claim to being the very first Europeans to see the east coast of Australia. The idea of creating a colony in New Holland took shape, and the legal fiction of Terra Nullius was born. At that time, the British believed indigenous people only had right to sovereignty over their land if they changed the landscape through agriculture and building. Cook knew the inhabitants of the Australian east coast used fire. Cook actually called it the continent of smoke, but they didn't associate fire with agriculture. So the British decided that New Holland was untouched by mankind. Terra nullius, and theirs to claim. Cook and his crew stepped ashore and proclaimed this strange land for England. Although that's actually not quite true, because he actually proclaimed it for George III. But that was mission accomplished. Cook's secret orders led to the conquering of a continent that would in time bring Britain great wealth. But it came at enormous expense to the indigenous Australians whose land and way of life was taken from them. The stories of the victims of state secrets are just as important as those of the victors. On my next time travel, I'm meeting a casualty of the Cold War. To find him, I'm going from the 1770s to the 1960s, to a place you'd least expect. I've come to the regional city of Bendigo in Victoria to meet a man whose life was changed forever by a chance encounter. Imagine the scene. 
It's the summer of 1962 here on Bendigo High Street, and there's a man pacing up and down and up and down, and in the curb there is a mini right here. Up and down he paces, up and down, and eventually he puts his hand on the door, opens it, gets in, and starts talking to this man. Who yeah. was this mysterious bloke, Philip, and what was it he wanted? He called himself Mr Mech, and uh, he said he was uh, an ASIO agent. Which means what? Uh, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. And were you aware of that organisation? Never heard of it. Forget the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Cold War had come to Bendigo, and ASIO was recruiting new agents. The younger, the better, apparently. I was 19. You were a bit young, weren't you? Young and naive, yes, yes, yes. So you went home and told your parents? Yes. Mr Mack said, well, here's some papers. Uh, you're too young to uh, sign them yourself. The Official Secrets Act? Of course. I had to take them home to my mum and dad for them to sign, which they said, you know, are you sure you know what you're doing, Phil, you know? And I, to be honest, I said, well, I, I, I'm not... Absolutely I'm no not, idea. No yeah. idea. Why do you think that you did it? Well, I think it was out of patriotism. Uh, because my friends are all off to uh, Vietnam and uh, I hadn't, uh, had, my number hadn't come up. So it was for Queen and Country? Well, yes, Queen and Country. So now you're a spy? Who were the people you were spying on? Communists, Tony. What were they like? They were just ordinary, everyday people, or working class people between late 50s to early 60s. So getting on? Getting on, and yeah. It was more than 10 years since the Communists had had any real political clout, and Philip's targets were its senior citizens. Who was your minder? Was it Mr Mack? No, I had Mr Mack first, and then I had about six or seven others. And you had to meet them at secret places? Secret places, always secret places. What sort of places? Oh, like the bush, uh, down the lake. For two decades, Philip masqueraded as a Communist. The deception cost him his marriage, his friends, and his reputation. But Philip's commitment to the cause never wavered. But then, after 23 years, it's staggering that it was that long. Yes. One of your minders got in touch with you and said he wanted to meet you at the Shamrock Hotel. In 1986, Philip's ASIO minder summoned him to a lunch on the balcony. So you had the meal and a bit of small talk. Then what did he say? You are no longer required in the organisation. And he and gave you an envelope? Handed me an envelope, and the envelope contained $1,200 for 23 years' service. And that was all the money you ever got from them, apart from expenses? That's right. And How did you feel, then? Oh, well, I was... I, feel, I felt gutted, and I, I... Even to this day, I feel gutted. And they told you that you were never allowed to contact them again? Exactly right. Did you? I tried once. I rang the field agent and he said to me, Phil, don't ever ring here again. We're going to change the number. And the extraordinary thing to me is that it happened right here in Bendigo. Exactly right. I just hope that this meal has been a bit better than the other one. Eh, uh, Tony. Nice to meet you. You too. Bye. Bye. Philip, such a gentle and sweet guy. I didn't have the heart to tell him that in the 1960s, I used to hang around with Marxists and communists and I was demonstrating against the Vietnam War. In fact, if I'd been living in Bendigo at the time, it would have been me that Philip would have been spying on. But Australia's communist paranoia wasn't isolated to Bendigo. I'm now heading back to the 1950s to discover another top secret program that took surveillance to a whole other level. Alice Springs in 1955 couldn't have been further from the world stage. But unbeknownst to its inhabitants, it was about to become involved in the biggest geopolitical crisis of the century. This little man-made hump in the landscape's very intriguing. In fact, it's more than intriguing. This was at one time of top-secret international importance because 
It was here where they used to monitor who'd got nuclear weapons and whether or not they were testing them. The business end was, was down there, of course. Harold, you were in the US forces at the time, weren't you? I was. So what was it exactly they were doing down there? This vault holds a set of seismometers that is used to detect earthquakes and nuclear explosions. And it's a part of the United States Atomic Energy Detection System. With the nuclear arms race hotting up, US Army General Dwight Eisenhower urgently needed a monitoring system that could detect atomic explosions anywhere in the world. Around 20 detection stations were set up, including one right here in Alice Springs. And it really was secret, wasn't it? Yes. We'd meet people downtown and they'd say, what do you do out there? Oh, we're a weather research station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even today, a lot of people around here don't know what no. this place was. They don't. Can we have a look inside? We absolutely can. Okay. There's a ladder on this side. <laughs> right, am I going down first? I guess you're going down first. Wait. It's very rusty and a little bit scary. These old bones of mine don't work like they did when they were 20. Uh, here we go. In here. This is what we've got. Hang it on, Harold. Oh, getting there. Yeah. What would have been in these great big container things? The seismometers themselves were in here. I believe this was the vertical motion detector. That one there. And one of these was north-south horizontal motion, the other one was east-west. What was it actually that they detected? They, they detect ground motion. The actual ground that you're standing on never stands still. You don't realize it, but it's always moving. But essentially, that must be the earthquakes or yes. nuclear explosions. Yep. Yes. yep, that was our job, to, to record everything and then determine if anything was the nuclear events that we were looking at. In the early 60s, the, the Russians in the US was testing like every other day, it seemed like. Yeah. But as time went by and, and nuclear test ban treaties were signed and, and, a, and moratoriums self-imposed were there and all that, you get half a dozen a year, maybe, I would suspect, of Russia. The US had their own share also. In retrospect, was it worth it? All that work that you did, was it worthwhile? I think that we made it a safer place for, for mankind, and I think we're still doing that. The organization still runs, it's still doing its job, and they do it really well. You know what I find so extraordinary? 40 years or so ago, all that was cutting-edge technology, and now it's as redundant as a cannon from the Crimean War. It's such a fast pace our history goes now, doesn't it? It's doubtful that Harold's equipment would have detected it, but for my final time travel, I'm going from the 50s to the 70s, when a political earthquake took place that shook Australia to its very core. I've come to Canberra, the heart of Australian government, to expose a 40-year-old secret. The 1975 dismissal was a constitutional menage a trois, pitting PM and Labour hero Gough Whitlam against the ambitious but weak-willed Governor-General Sir John Kerr and the autocratic Liberal opposition leader Malcolm Fraser. These days, it's a well-told story but I'm about to uncover a political conspiracy that, had it been known at the time, could have led to a very different ending. Jenny, this is a story that's always absolutely fascinated me. And what happened on that day itself? If you look at the, uh, at the coverage, the newspaper coverage of the early morning of November 11th, 1975, there was a sort of a lull around Canberra. There was an expectation that the political crisis which had been in existence for the previous month with supply bills blocked in the Senate had actually lifted because Whitlam had decided he would call a half-Senate election. That was the political decision that would actually resolve the crisis situation. But Kerr jumped the gun and sacked his government. Whitlam, though, had an ace up his sleeve. He went to the House of Reps and moved a successful motion of no confidence in the now caretaker Prime Minister, Fraser. Malcolm Fraser should at that point have resigned. But a second thing happened which you might see as a second dismissal, which is that Sir John Kerr, the Governor-General, refused to, to, to receive the Speaker of the House of Representatives and refused to accept that motion of no confidence, calling for Whitlam to be reinstated. Instead, he dissolved 
both Houses of Parliament and of course that led to an immense crowd gathering outside this very building. And that of course gave us one of the most memorable and imitated speeches in Australian politics. All together now, well may we say God save the Queen because nothing will save the Governor-General. Why did John Kerr do this? I mean, he was just supposed to do a fairly simple job of representing the Queen of England, wasn't he? Well, what we now know, and this has only been recently discovered in Sir John Kerr's private papers, is that at the time, unknown to the Prime Minister, a member of the High Court of Australia, Sir Anthony Mason, was meeting with the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, regularly, uh, discussing the possibility of dismissing the government for two months prior to the dismissal actually taking place. Well, I would have thought that some of this stuff could have gone to the High Court, so that would make the High Court judge complicit in what was going on. Well, that's right, and for all those reasons, it was absolutely extraordinary that not only that they were meeting, but that they were meeting without the knowledge of the Prime Minister. I mean, the breach of protocol, the breach in the, in the separation of powers, the, 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 the really questionable moral decisions on a personal level that were made by deceiving a Prime Minister in that way is really, I think, extremely significant. And who knows, if the public had got wind of what Kerr and Mason were up to, then the impropriety of the Governor-General's behaviour may have tipped the dismissal into being politically unacceptable. No wonder they both wanted to keep it under wraps all these years. I mean, the outcry if the Queen would ever presume to remove an elected government in, in Britain can only be imagined. And yet in Australia, it was a sort of reassertion of that divine right of kings to, to remove an elected government and to replace that government with a party that had actually lost the previous two elections. So yes, I think there's no doubt now that it should never have happened, but it did happen. And so it sits there now as an unfortunate precedent that could technically occur again. Well, let's hope it never, ever does. I'm with you on that, Tony. <laughs> never Thank so you. much. Bye-bye. And on that note, my time travels through the world of political intrigue and deception have come to an end. On this journey, I've witnessed how state secrets can influence everything from the destiny of governments and empires to the paths of ordinary people's lives. I've discovered the extraordinary lengths the powerful will go to to deceive the public but no matter how hard the authorities try, eventually the truth comes out. Which makes me wonder, what secrets are governments keeping from us now?